It is a strange thing how little, in general, people know about the sky. It is the part of creation in which nature has done more for the sake of pleasing man, more for the sole and evident purpose of talking to him and teaching him, than in any other of her works, and it is just the part in which we least attend to her. John Ruskin In this offering I will share reality, perception, wonder, archetype and hopefully a sprinkle of wisdom regarding the sky luminaries. Many are looking to the horizon, to the shape, to computer screens, to other land, to mental models, but not many are looking up at what is actually real and observable. Most notable in the luminaries mysterium is what we call the sun, an epic and enigmatic source of real cycles, real energy and real wonder. There is nothing new under the sun. Truth is singular and eternal. The sun is a focal point of life-giving heat and light. Only a fool states they know what it is. The close sun within our realm makes one full westward revolution every 24 hours, spiralling out and gradually faster to the Tropic of Capricorn on the winter solstice, and spiralling in and gradually slower to the Tropic of Cancer on the summer solstice, thus giving us the seasons. Looking to the west, we can see a sunset move slightly to the right, curving around on its path. And close to the summer solstice, in northern Norway, we can see the sun never sets to the observer. Here is another way to view the summer solstice. The smaller dome here is a human's observable area, and the larger dome could be presented as a flat sky. This is still an unknown. Here is another way to look at the equinoxes. From Tenerife in June, the top is what the human eye observes, and below is what is really going on. The analema is where one takes a photo or plot point of the sun at the same time of day from the same location over a year. This is from Hong Kong in the Northern Hemisphere and there is a bigger loop for when the sun is in the Southern Hemisphere because the sun covers more distance there in its orbit. This clearly shows that the orbit of the sun expands and contracts. It matters not if the analema is taken from the equator or from the Southern Hemisphere either. The Southern loop is always bigger, as one would expect. Here in Stellarium, I have set the time to 5 pm in Europe, faced southwest, and turned on the ecliptic, which is the sun's path. When we keep jumping 24 hours ahead, we can see the sun has completed one orbit each time, and in late May, we can see it's getting higher in the sky towards the summer solstice on the 21st of June, and then starts to go lower in the sky towards the winter solstice in December. 
Don't let anyone sell you the 23 hours and 56 minutes a day nonsense. In real life, as it shows in Stellarium, we can see only a section of the night sky. When we move, our vanishing point also moves with us. And therefore, what we can see in the sky moves with us too. We know the sky appears to the eye as a dome, but this could be due to perspective. I mean, here it looks like the ground goes up and that the tracks go together, when we know these aren't true. The human eye's vanishing point shows us a visual reality that is not always objective. We simply have not unraveled the flat sky or dome mystery yet. This is all new. This awakening of true cosmology only made a comeback in 2014, the year I also first spoke out about it publicly. In many cases, we need to revel in the mystery and enjoy the mystery. The sun comes into the observer's vanishing point. This is known to most as a sunrise. The sun goes out of the observer's vanishing point. This is known to most as a sunset. If we go up in altitude, the sun comes back into one's field of view as the vanishing point has increased. When the sun sets in Japan, it's at its zenith in Madagascar, and also rising in Florida. Some ballpark trigonometry shows the sun is around 2,000 to 4,000 miles away. Well, that is, if it is an actual thing within the rules of known physics, which it possibly isn't. Now these sunrises and sunsets often appear as different sizes. This is due to one or more of the following. The observer's position, land contour, sea temperature, atmospheric haze, and atmospheric temperature. So how high is our sun? We have seen evidence of localized hotspots. This blue sky layer is around 15 kilometers thick. Why it's blue, nobody really knows. Some say scattering. Some say ionized gases, others say plasma. The truth is, it is also a part of the luminaries mysterium. This puppy isn't 93 million miles away. If you believe that, then you've had too much exposure to government scripture. I've even heard rumors that some lovers love each other so much that they have a child, and then they give the child away most of the week to centers that program them with government scripture but that's all for another time. The sun doesn't have flares, but it does have sunspots. Nobody knows what these are or what creates them, but they do help us prove that the sun above oscillates, which appears to the observer as rotation. The actual light of the sun does many wondrous and irrational things, near impossible to work out logically. Here is the model for sunlight observation for various months. Actual sunlight at any one time is never the same for two different observers. Sunlight has evidence of curve, bend, bulge, mystery, beauty and wonder. The reasons are unknown, and that makes so many uncomfortable. We don't even know if it is really an object. We do know it is a focal point of light and heat. For me it is probably intelligent consciousness in some way, maybe half in this reality and half in another. It could just be far beyond our comprehension altogether, a reflective or geometric masterpiece of spiritual consciousness, a luminary of the mysterium. The sun has been worshipped and measured for aeons. The Aztec sunstone calendar 
marks our present world as the fifth sun to them. The Aztecs saw themselves as the people of the sun, whose divine duty was to sacrifice blood to provide the sun with its nourishment. In India, the Konark Temple of the Sun in Orissa, from at least 2000 BC, has complex and intricate sundials. These 24 wheels use complex and detailed shading and measures a magnitude of different units of time and cycles, mostly from sunlight. All around the world there are symbols for the sun and temples aligned to the sun, marking the solstice and equinox. Astrologically, the sun represents one's basic personality, ego and outward vitality. It rules the star constellation of Leo. There are many sun gods all around the world, from Egypt to India and to the current Jesus archetype in Christianity. Now much of Christianity is about the sky luminaries, known as astrotheology. Jesus is the son of God, the sun that travels through the twelve zodiac signs. Twelve disciples he travels around with, twelve brothers of Joseph, twelve tribes of Israel. The Last Supper painting by the alchemist da Vinci shows all the zodiac signs having the last supper of the year before the crucifixion of the sun in November. After the kiss of death by Scorpio, Judas. The birth of Jesus on the 25th of December is when the sun rises from its lowest point of the year. The sun is born. Now these stories you can find in other sun deities that are much older than Jesus. The Roman Emperor Constantine, pretty much the founder of Christianity, was a sun worshipper, even after he gave Christianity to the masses in the early 4th century. He also changed the day of worship from the Sabbath to Sunday. The sun was a big part of the secret recipe for the Hermetic alchemists, for the creation of the Philosopher's Stone. and it sits at the centre of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it states in 11.22.31, Sight, visible form, and the reflected image of the sun within the aperture of the eye, all work together to reveal one another. But the original sun standing in the sky is self-manifested. Similarly, the Supreme Soul, the original cause of all entities, who is thus separate from all of them, acts by the illumination of his own transcendental experience, as the ultimate source of manifestation of all mutually manifesting objects. Democritus, in the BC, said a quote that will help us as we continue through the other luminaries. It will be apparent that it is difficult to discern which properties each thing possesses in reality. The moon is the other large luminary in the sky. It has always been an enigma. It has always been worshipped, and its energy through its mystical phases affect much life in this reality. A mystic once said, look at the moon in the sky, not the one in the lake. Another said, moonlight drowns out all but the brightest stars. A Taoist author once said, the moon does not fight, it attacks no one, it does not worry, it does not try to crush others, it keeps its course, but by its very nature, it gently influences. The moon is the same size and distance as the sun, and follows close to the sun's path, the ecliptic. The moon takes about 24 hours and 51 minutes to complete a revolution above us, slower than the sun. The moon is always close to the ecliptic, within 5 degrees above or below. It also comes and goes, just like we saw with the sun. The moon crosses the sun's ecliptic approximately every two weeks. These crossings are known as lunar nodes. If it crosses the ecliptic at full moon, we have a lunar eclipse. If it crosses the ecliptic at new moon, we have a solar eclipse. Remember this for later. The moon takes an average of 29 days, 12 hours and 44 minutes to go through one lunar month, one lunar cycle, from new moon 
through waxing, full, waning, back to new moon. Because of this motion, the moon has a point in time each lunar month when it is closest to the Earth, perigee, and a point in time where it is farthest from the Earth, apogee. The Sun moves faster than the Moon. The Sun catches up with it, creating a new Moon, and then speeds ahead of it. More accurately here, we can see the lunar phases are caused by the relative geometry of the Moon to the Sun in the flat Earth sky. These two luminaries are linked by what one could call pranic, magnetic electro, or chi energy. The first quarter Moon is when it is half illuminated and occurs when the Sun and Moon are 90 degrees apart in the sky. At full moon, the moon is fully powered and fully illuminated, when the sun and moon are 180 degrees apart in the sky. The moon self-luminates and self-deluminates. It powers up and powers down. There is evidence to suggest this geometric relationship creates the tides in the oceans too, as salt water is ionized and can react to magnetic electro. Another way of talking about the motion of these luminaries is to say the Moon travels 14.5 degrees an hour and the Sun 15 degrees an hour. So the Moon loses 12 degrees a day on the Sun. People are okay that the Sun is self-luminating, so people should also be okay that the Moon is self-luminating too. A nice way to remember if the Moon is waxing or waning is if it is like a letter C or D. A cat goes, waning, and a dog comes, waxing. These phases can be known far into the future due to the Sun and Moon's constant speeds. This works as a geometric clockwork, a calendar in the sky so to speak. Chinese, Thai, Hindu, Islam and Hebrew calendars still today are linked to the Moon cycles, the lunar month. If one photographs the Moon 51 minutes later on successive days, note, due to the Moon rising about 51 minutes later each day, over one lunar month it will trace out its own analemma. The Moon can be seen above in the sky at the same time in distant places. Depending on where one is on a line of longitude depends on what degree of rotation the Moon will be. To a stationary observer, the Moon also appears to rotate as it moves from east to west in the sky. This is only due to perspective. The Moon is not actually rotating. It will appear to rotate one way until it is above one's head and then the other way. Regardless of location, every human on Earth has only ever seen one face of the Moon. Therefore it is irrational that it appears to many human subconscious and conscious mind as spherical. In a waning phase, the closer the Sun gets to the Moon, the more power, or self-illumination, the Moon loses. And when the Sun is very close to the Moon, it loses its power, it loses its self-illumination, the Moon disappears. Some say we should really see a black silhouette, we don't though, we see nothing, and can pick up nothing with cameras or telescopes. It's just not there. This new moon really could be just that, a brand new moon, and we will layer up on this information later. Then a few days after new moon, at the waxing crescent phase, one can see the slither become illuminated, and the moon starts gaining its power again. Even at other times during the lunar cycle, we can very rarely see something appear to go through the moon, and in this footage, it is unknown if this is a star wandering star, or high altitude drone. At other times, the Moon appears as though the blue sky is coming through the Moon, but the Moon is higher than the layer of blue sky. So is the Moon semi-transparent here? Is the Moon not totally there in these instances? When the Moon is half illuminated, is the other half there or not? Again, the Luminaries Mysterium has not given us a clear and rational answer as yet. We don't know. We have to continue to revel in the mystery. We don't know what the Moon is.
We don't know what craters are. In truth, they are just different shades of light and dark. Worth noting, though, that in the Electric Universe community, laboratory experiments using electric arcs by plasma physicist CJ Ransom created craters. Is the mainstream story for the 22 degree halos another wild myth? It's almost as if the moon and sun are piercing into this reality, or piercing into a layer in our sky. Both look like spheres to our subconscious, but simply this cannot be so. The moon gives us energy for sure, but whether it is a projection, an actual object, or even an old malfunctioning sun, we don't know. The word eclipse comes from a Greek word meaning abandonment. Quite literally, an eclipse was seen as the sun on a solar eclipse and moon on a lunar eclipse abandoning Earth. The lunar eclipse is only possible exactly on a full moon, when the sun and moon are directly opposite, and also when the moon is at the crossing point of the ecliptic, at the lunar node, when h1 and h2 in the image are at the same altitude. This is all akin to a super tight and accurate astrological aspect of opposition. Any solar year has a minimum of four eclipses, two solar and two lunar, and it is possible to have up to six or seven eclipses in a single solar year. The moon is full, fully charged, and then it loses power, preparing energy, retracting, then it sparks, surges, pulses. The moon becomes reddish as it continues its potent energetic link with the sun. A pranic or magnetic electro handshake with the sun. Blinking, flickering. It seems to be a reset of sorts, or more wildly, a malfunction or false kickstart of an old sun trying to recharge itself and then it regains power. The lunar eclipses are seen where it is night time, and over a massive land space with the same intensity. They last for a few hours, much longer than the minutes of a solar eclipse. The changing colour during a lunar eclipse is seen simultaneously by people in different continents, and because of this, the obstruction theory from old Vedic myth is impossible. The theory that it is obstructed by another celestial body, such as Rahu, Ketu, Shadow Planet, Mount Maru, Black Sun or Lilith, is easily debunked, as it would only be visible in a small location. You see, with this lunar eclipse, any obstructing body would be huge, many times bigger than the moon. The solar eclipse has caused fear and been associated with myth, legend and superstition throughout history. Even today, an eclipse of the sun is considered a bad omen in many cultures. Esoterically and astrologically, I would say never make a big life decision near or on an eclipse, only unless you really know what you are doing with bringing the energy down and harnessing it. Predicting eclipses has been going on for millennia too, as early as 600 BC by Thales. Saros astrology can predict eclipses and this goes back to Chaldean and Babylonian astronomers. A solar eclipse is only possible exactly on a new moon, when the sun and moon are directly together, and also when the moon is at the crossing point of the ecliptic, at the lunar node, when h1 and h2 in the image are at the same altitude. This is all akin to a super tight and accurate astrological aspect of conjunction. Now many strange humans think there is 93 million miles between these two luminaries, and one is 400 times bigger. <laughs> this is where the moon is, it cannot be anywhere else. But as we saw earlier, the moon is transparent, stroke disappeared, at this time. We believe the moon is passing over the sun, it should be. But looking at these filtered images, nothing is there. 
It matters not what one does with telescope or imagery software, one cannot find a trace of the moon. It is as though the sun eats itself. It's really important you understand the moon is not there. Then you might wake up to the magic and mysticism of this realm we are in. Totality during a full solar eclipse can only be seen from a very small area on Earth. This area is usually about 100 miles or 160 kilometers wide and about 10,000 miles or 16,000 kilometers long. Areas outside this track may be able to see a partial eclipse of the Sun. This thin strip is pure flat Earth truth, as a shadow is never smaller than the object casting it. Many think the Vedic dark luminary of Rahu covers the Sun. Rahu, the god of darkness, the black sun, the shadow planet. This cannot be true as the total solar eclipse lasts for only a few minutes at any given place. Objectively, all we know is the sun appears to eat itself due to the pranic handshake. A resetting, a new sun cycle, a refreshed sun. The Vedic myths of Rahu and Ketu are simply archetypes of the lunar nodes, and their myths are spoke of at length in my free moon ebook. There are three types of solar eclipse, partial, annular, and total. The difference between a total and annular eclipse helps to confirm that the moon moves closer and farther from us, perigee and apogee. I wrote a thesis in the moon book about whether the moon could be an old malfunctioning sun. Let go of old notions and listen to the logic. The moon is the same size and altitude as the sun. The moon travels in almost the same trajectory as the sun. The moon is a little slower than the sun. The moon's power and charge is directly linked by its geometry to the sun. Both affect plants and animals and all life on earth. Both have evidence of being magnetic electro in their nature. There are many ancient myths as to which sun we are in. For example, Aztecs say we are in the fifth sun, and my free moon book contains many other supporting myth, legend, and pantheon. The moon is awash with mystique, myth, superstition, and esoterica. The new moon is like a start of a wave, the start of new intentions. The full moon is like the crashing of the wave, and the waning moon is like the decay of a wave retreating. A healthy woman in her power has her menstrual cycle during or near full moon or new moon. It is more beneficial esoterically to fast or cleanse the days before a new moon. At full moon, the pineal gland opens more and the spiritual veil is thinner, so to speak. Most humans have dense energy and live in the five senses and personality matrix and are disconnected from the moon's energetic cycles. The moon phases also affect the planting of crops and plants and many, many other things. In astrological terms, the moon is one's soul, emotions, moods, and subconscious, and is home in the sign of cancer, which links to feelings, trust, intuition, nurture, and mothering. The moon has over a hundred deities from all around the world, dating back millennia. These cover moon worship, adoration or veneration of the moon, a deity in the moon, fertility, or a personification or symbol of the moon, most notably Diana with the Romans and the earlier Greek Selene, Artemis, Hecate Triad. Some even say Islam and Allah came from a lunar cult, from pre-Islamic Arabic myth. In hermetic alchemy, the sun and moon need to be reconciled within the self, the inner male and female, logic and emotion, communication and feeling, all united in perfect balance before the elixir can be achieved. The moon is the violet ninth sephiroth in Kabbalah and is linked to initiation and many other things. In ancient Arabia, the moon's path through the 12 zodiac signs over a lunar year was split into 28 lunar mansions. 
with each one ruled by a spirit that could be invoked. Talismans and amulets were used within this system too. No matter which mansion, benevolent magic was done on waxing moon and malevolent during waning. This system was popular in the Renaissance period in Europe and one can still find it in use to this very day. Her charms are for sure, a mystery unto herself. The word planet comes from the Greek word planetos, meaning wandering star. The wandering stars are eight specific luminaries in the sky. From the left in the image, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the dimmer and slower Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. The wandering stars are rays of energy, and they represent certain ideas and archetypes that all ideas and archetypes root back to. A conception of the universe, inside you too. The macrocosm in the microcosm, the microcosm in the macrocosm, as above so below. Each of the wandering stars are linked to certain symbols, myth and deity, as we will soon see. This ancient geocentric model was actually pretty close to the truth and lasted for over a thousand years before the elite smashed it up. The error here is that each of the wandering stars are actually all quite close to the ecliptic. Each are probable to be a similar distance from the Earth. But correctly here, some are faster than others. Note too that each wandering star has a unique brightness and colour. Another crude way to aesthetically show the wandering stars is here, all close to the ecliptic. Note though that the speeds here are not correct. Each of the wandering stars has its own retrograde motion. Retrograde is a term used to describe the phenomenon of each wandering star stopping and then reversing direction in the flat earth sky, before continuing forwards again. A famous aesthetic depiction of the wandering stars was from the model from Ptolemy, who died in 160 AD. His model, mocked today by the masses, was actually quite close to what is. This model is close, but each wandering star is actually close to the ecliptic, less of a distance between them. Therefore these bigger circles and orbits and gaps are not correct. Also it is not certain if the retrograde motions are doing a loop in altitude, or simply going into retrograde at the same altitude. I cannot repeat enough that each wandering star has a unique motion stroke cycle that is independent from all other sky luminaries. These motions, no matter how they are depicted, always present harmonic geometry. We will go into this a little more later. One could do hours on each of the wandering stars, I am to share a few minutes regarding each of their motions, characteristics and archetypal energy, the core force of prana from each. Mercury comes from the Latin of Miercoles. It has an English translation meaning Wednesday. Mercury rules Wednesdays. Mercury is not what the elite wants you to think it is. A rotating spherical rock 50 million miles away has mind controlled the masses. The adjectives that come to my mind are divine, geometric, fractal, interdimensional and conscious. Mercury always travels close to the sun and due to this it is the most difficult to see with the naked eye. Here I've turned off sunlight stroke daylight so we can move forward 24 hours a click and see its motion forwards, retrograde, then back to the same point again. It's repeating cycle taking 88 days to complete. If we look at any astrological chart depiction, all luminaries revolve around the flat earth in the middle, all close together at the ecliptic. The moon may be appearing to move quickly here, but it's actually going slower than the sun, so it falls behind every 24 hours. Mercury stays close to the sun, passing it, then retrograding behind it. Does Mercury orbit the sun? Is this a loop? like Ptolemy thought. We don't really know for sure, but it is probable at least sometimes 
due to Mercury sometimes not passing behind the Sun, but passing in front of the Sun, 13 or 14 times per century, known as the Mercury Transit. Now one needs special filters to witness this, and it helps prove just how small the wandering stars are. The next Mercury Transit is in November 2019, then in 2032. This event lasts about 6 hours or so. So usually Mercury passes behind the Sun, or does it do something similar to the Moon and disappear when close to the Sun? Who's to say it hasn't disappeared when in front, and the black circle is due to some magnetic electro or pranic handshake, akin to a solar eclipse? It is said that Mercury has phases, just like the Moon, a long 88 day cycle to complete the phases. This graphic is crude, I'm again not saying it loops, and this could be drawn as a straight line, or an ellipse, or a circle, but it shows, like the Moon, the side closest to the Sun is self-luminated. That the 26% phase on the left is bigger than the 51% phase next to it, if these images are trustworthy, this would suggest a looping higher in altitude during retrograde. Mercury astrologically signifies mind, learning, communication, thoughts, logic, reason and knowledge. It rules the constellation of Virgo, Earth, the energy of intellectualism, rationale and practicality, the orderly and helpful ray of service that overconforms. It also rules the constellation of Gemini, Air, the energy of information, intelligence, change, talking, being social, spontaneous, fickleness and indecision. Mercury retrograde is feared more than other retrogrades of other wandering stars. In retrograde the power and force of the ray of energy is weakened, it's gone back on itself. In Mercury retrograde, electrics can play up, communication and contracts can be delayed or have misunderstandings. It's a time to back up, re-look at things, and not to start big new projects, sign new contracts, or to buy new electrical goods, properties or vehicles. The most notable deities and archetypes linked to Mercury were the Roman god of wealth, word and commerce. Also Hermes, the Greek god of alchemy, born from Thoth, the Egyptian god of writing, knowledge and the emerald tablet. In Kabbalah it is the 8th Sephiroth, and linked to many other things. Venus is from the Latin word viernes, meaning Friday. Venus is far from what your local gatekeeper school science teacher thinks. Here we can see the Sun and Moon, Mercury in orange, and Venus in small white. Like Mercury, Venus always travels close to the Sun, but is slower, and travels further away from the Sun than Mercury, in a slower cycle, ensuring Venus to be the morning star before the Sun, or the evening star after the Sun. This Venus cycle takes 225 days. To the naked eye, Venus doesn't appear to twinkle, but instead glows with a bright and steady silvery light, making her the second brightest light in the night sky after the Moon. Out of the wandering stars, it is only Venus and Mercury that have phases. So Venus also appears to get smaller and bigger, so again, it either has an apogee and perigee, or it simply gets smaller and bigger where it is, at the same altitude. Here we can see some esoteric labels for Venus different phases, known as its underworld cycle. Its descent from the evening star, to its birth as the morning star. Again, this doesn't have to be drawn as a loop or orbit of the Sun, it could be a straight line. Her full synodic cycle, from inferior conjunction to inferior conjunction, takes near 584 days, or about 1.6 years. This is due to the interaction of Venus's 225 day cycle with the 365 day solar cycle. Now Venus, whether it loops around the Sun or not, when it conjuncts with the Sun, it creates these five points, and these five points are in perfect geometry above us. This is known as the Dance of Venus. 
and these five points make the perfect pentagram. Fractals in the sky. This was all known to the mystics of the Renaissance period. This is the current Venus cycle within its current dance. Venus also creates geometric patterns with Mercury, all from a random Big Bang they tell your children, via their worldwide mind control program. Venus is the only other wandering star, as well as Mercury, that sometimes appears to pass in front of the Sun. Like Mercury, we don't really know if it is in front of the Sun, or in the Sun, or if it disappears like the Moon due to some pranic handshake. A Venus transit is more rare though, this reoccurrence pattern of 8 plus 105.5 plus 8 plus 121.5 years repeats itself in the catalogue of Venus transits. An example of this pattern is in the transits of 1874, 1882, then 2004 and 2012. Note that Venus appears larger than Mercury when transiting the Sun. Now if one takes a photo from the same location every 24 hours, over 113 years, one sees another dance between the Sun and Venus. One gets an analemma. Here is an analemma from Venus and Mercury. It can be argued that both orbit the Sun. but it may not be the case. Look here, this dot is moving in a simple elliptical path. But if other dots are added, it appears to now go vertical. Vertical up and down, but side to side. It is only elliptical when presented alone, so don't jump to conclusions with Venus and Mercury. Venus astrologically signifies aesthetic beauty, romance, courting, relationship dynamics, gentle harmony, grace and the sensual feminine. It rules the constellation of Libra, air, the energy of balance, harmony, the lover, analysis and strong mind. It also rules the constellation of Taurus, earth, the energy of nature, luxury, possessions and grounded endurance. Venus retrograde is not really the time to start new big relationships or to get married. Linked deity and archetype include Isis, Aphrodite, Cleopatra and the Roman goddess Venus. In Kabbalah it is the seventh Sephiroth. And this tree of life is many things including a meditative glyph and a table of classification. Where every myth, herb, gemstone, scent and deity ever known will find its rightful place upon the tree. In a Sephiroth or in one of the 22 paths. The old Mayan Dresden Codex was all about accurately measuring Venus cycles. And on the last page depicted a cataclysmic flood. Mars, Saturn and Jupiter are less complex. They simply move around the ecliptic with no care for the sun or any other luminaries. They each sometimes go retrograde too, but no phases and no transits. Luminaries in the sky, simply doing their own thing. They say Mars has two moons, Jupiter 64, Saturn 62. But there is no evidence these are moons. We can just see a few small luminaries in the sky that hang out with a bigger luminary. There is also no evidence of any rings at Saturn. This animation you should understand more now. Venus, Mars, Saturn and Jupiter have been added and are moving 72 hours a click. Mars takes 687 days to complete its cycle. Jupiter takes 12 years and Saturn takes 29 years. If you don't understand this animation fully, don't worry, we will layer up more later. Again, due to their retrograde motions, many geometric patterns can be found between these wandering stars. 
Mars rules Scorpio and Aries, and is the energy of the daring warrior, strength, action, destruction, the male principle. It's linked to gods of war. Jupiter rules Sagittarius and Pisces. It is the energy of expansion, journeys, faith, wealth, mercy and fortune, and is linked to deities of justice and kings. Saturn rules Capricorn and Aquarius. It is the energy of restriction, limiting, discipline, solitude, structure. It is linked to deities that reap. Many people freak out due to the archetype of Saturn that eats children. This is really just to show that it is slow and returns when one is no longer a child. But for sure, the current elite do like to munch on a child sandwich when they get together. In Kabbalah, Mars is the fifth, Jupiter the fourth, and Saturn the third Sephiroth. And again, each force of energy has many attributes in the Kabbalistic tables of correspondence. I'm old school and don't really care too much for Uranus, Neptune or Pluto. They are so dim and slow, and they were only discovered in recent centuries. They say Uranus has 27 moons, Neptune 13 and Pluto 5. Again, just tiny lights in the sky that hang out. These three generational forces simply move around the ecliptic super slow. Uranus takes 87 years, Neptune 165 years and Pluto 248 years to get back to the same place, on the ecliptic, to complete their cycle to get back to the same place on the ecliptic. They are known in the matrix as outer planets, but in reality they are simply dimmer and slower and there is no evidence they are further away. Due to points of retrograde over tens of thousands of years, Uranus and Neptune will do their own geometric dance. Uranus is the energy of rebellious change, freedom, revolution and awakening. Neptune the energy of dreams, mystic awareness and idealism. Pluto, the energy of subconscious forces, death and rebirth, power, obsession and truth. There is a whole host of geometry in the sky when looking at various combinations of wandering stars. But no evidence of spheres, rocks, gas giants, light years or any other of the government fairy tales. The wandering stars are each magnificent and radiant forces of energy that contain the human psyche and our subconscious archetypes. The wandering stars have many tables of classification and attributes. They also link to the days of the week. And this star shows the order too. Now in the time of alchemy, Greek mystics, and then the Renaissance period, many mystics created art of what is known as the celestial spheres. This isn't calling any wandering star a sphere, or showing their distance, or physical order. These show the levels of vibration, the levels of frequency, from a spiritual perspective. They always take the order, Earth, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the firmament of fixed stars, then into the world of divinity, the premium mobile. Paradise. Infinity. Many allude to the idea a council of gods reside here, each from one of the celestial spheres, each of the wandering stars. Through the celestial spheres, into heaven. Even Dante alluded to this in his cosmology. As did Robert Flood. 
But what does this all really mean? This is all Kabbalistic, the soul's journey to Godhead, while within the body, within the same carnation, starting at ten, the four elements on earth, up to one, the Godhead. In Kabbalah, when we actually see a wandering star with our eyes, for example Jupiter, this is the densest of the four worlds within that luminary. There are another three levels of vibration, spiritually, for each wandering star, that the eyes cannot see. And Kabbalah uses these forces as a climbing frame and roadmap, so to speak. Many of you have fear of this information and call it bad, but Kabbalah and rays of energy in this realm are neither good or bad, they just are. The key is really the individual's own level of purity. I go into this much more in a book I wrote over 10 years ago now. Now Cornelius Agrippa was a German theologian and Christian mystic. He wrote the Arbitel in the early 1500s. In his system, he created a clean and divine way, using the correct day and planetary hour, of having commune with the God Force from each of the celestial spheres from each of the seven sacred wandering stars. Also known as the Olympic spirits from ancient Greece. These are like the one thing on a lower arc. They are fragmented aspects of its power. The Arbitel tells us that Olympic spirits, well, gods that rule the wandering stars, inhabit the firmament, which was the air and regions of space that held the stars together. The job of these gods is to declare destinies so far forth as God allows them. The gig here is not to worship the Olympic spirits, but to balance them in oneself and then move on to attain a unity with the God who expresses itself through these seven rays. In the great book Corpus Hermeticum, it states in the book of the Sacred Sermon, and the gods were seen in their ideas of the stars, with all their signs, and the stars were numbered, with gods in them. Also, and heaven was seen in seven circles, its gods were visible in forms of stars with all their signs, while nature had her members made articulate together with the gods in her, and heaven's periphery revolved in cyclic course, borne on by breath of God. Now for me, one reason for the NASA mind control and fake cosmology is that they really don't want people knowing this stuff. They even have so-called truthers, spiritualists, religious people and new agers against this information too, cowering in fear, unable to objectively research. You see, this magical realm we are in, if known by the masses, would bring their whole physical based system of control, greed and selfishness down in no time at all. So they spend hundreds of billions of dollars bringing everything into the dense physical. They are hiding divinity every way they can. You see, people walk past a statue of Mikael or Mary, no problem. People put a priest between them and God, no problem. But talk about the gods within the celestial spheres, the Olympic spirits, and people freak out. The levels of conditioning are far beyond what is rational. And where do you think the Olympic rings came from? The blanket of fixed stars all move in unison, as one, with next to no evidence of any parallax. The blanket of stars are probable to all reside at the same altitude behind and higher than the wandering stars, and probable to be somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 miles away from Earth. There are under 10,000 stars visible to the naked human eye, and because of the human eye's vanishing point, one can only see less than half of those from where one stands. Before we look at the blanket of stars' speed, motions, patterns and mystery, 
Let us look closely at what they could be. What are the stars? We don't have the correct labels in our vocabulary. The words that arise for me are geometric, intelligent, fractal, divine, holographic, interdimensional. Some even appear as diamonds. Some hollow. Is water involved? Is soul luminescence involved, where high frequency sound waves in liquid cause a bubble to implode into light? Are cymatics involved? The language of resonant frequency. Some even think stars in this reality are technical and related to these metal balls that are said to fall to Earth. If one zooms past a star and then increases the brightness, it can appear to the eye like the star is indented into the firmament. This is 160 times zoom at sunset with clear visibility. We just don't know. The luminary's mysterium cloaks its secrets from us. The blanket of stars revolve around Polaris, the North Star above the central North Pole. With time lapse, we can see this day after day, ruling out the lie of four motions. To find Polaris in the northern sky, just look for Ursa Minor or Ursa Major. From Chicago we look north and we see the stars rotate around Polaris and from Paris. And from near Japan. This is from southern Spain. The stars complete one cycle, stroke one revolution, every 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds, making them a little faster than the sun, with the moon being the slowest of the three. Here is a macro way to present these northern star trails. To get a good idea of the motion of stars, we need to look in different directions. Here is from Arizona, in southern USA, looking west, looking east, looking north, and looking south. There is a ring of 12 star constellations behind the ecliptic, known as the signs of the zodiac. This is the same even if one is in Chicago, North Mexico, southern Chile, or anywhere on Earth. 
So if one splits the circular 360 degree ecliptic up into 12, one gets 12 times 30 degrees, each being a sign of the zodiac, which all takes 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds to revolve above us. These constellations appear upside down to people in the southern areas of Earth, for the simple reasons shown here. As the stars take 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4 seconds to revolve, and the sun takes 24 hours to revolve, every 30 days or so, the sun enters a new sign of the zodiac, and then will spend around 30 days there until the zodiac has overtaken the sun again. This can be seen here too, with the zodiac being the outer thin ring of 12 signs. First we will move 2 hours forward a click, Then if we move 10 days forward a click, we see the zodiac speeding ahead, so the sun therefore travels through the 12 signs of the zodiac over a solar year. Due to us knowing all of the main speeds in the sky now, here is the approximate time each luminary spends within each of the 12 signs of the zodiac. We will come back to the zodiac again soon. Many naturally think, whether under a dome or a flat sky, that all the stars move in unison the same way, but this isn't so. South of the equator, an observer can see a wheel in the sky to the south, spinning in the opposite direction. And here are more examples. So to get our bearings, let's look from one location. New South Wales in Australia. Looking west. Looking east. Looking north where Polaris is too far away from the observer's vanishing point, and looking south. So this wheel at the south is interesting for two reasons. One, it creates a fractal if caught on time-lapse photography at different intervals, a bit like this, and two, because at three different locations on Earth, the exact same southern wheel can be observed in the sky. Again, this could be under a dome or a flat sky, but having the same three wheels in the southern sky is still currently fully unexplained, using the logic we know thus far within this realm. Some say reflective duplication. Some say it is the North Star's refracted, reflected or warped in some way. Others say perspective, but super interesting and relevant is that this southern will also takes 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds to revolve. We just don't know all the answers to the Luminaries Mysterium. The precession of the equinox is a real phenomena. Over 26,000 years, the whole blanket of stars completes a tiny wobble, ensuring that the exact point above the North Celestial Pole moves in a small, super slow circle. This is all known as the Great Year. If we go as north as possible on Earth, and look up with the equatorial grid on, Polaris is at the centre. Now if we turn the azimuthal grid on, we can see Polaris off-centre. And if we change the year by 2000 year chunks, the whole blanket of stars moves ever so slightly. The Earth isn't moving or tilting or wobbling, 
it's the blanket of stars moving. This movement in the sky is very slow, one degree every 72 years. So 360 degrees, a full revolution, every 26,000 years. The motion of the stars is like this. The zodiac signs move in one direction on the ecliptic, but the wobble is in reverse, hence the words procession of the equinox. So recently, from the age of Taurus, through to Aries, through to the current age of Pisces, and soon into the age of Aquarius. On every spring equinox, the sunrise to the east has the current age behind it, and we are coming out of Pisces into Aquarius. And due to the one degree wobble every 72 years, every 2160 years or so, humanity enters a new age. Here is the equinox sunrise for the year 4178, deep into the age of Aquarius. So the sun goes slowly through all 12 signs in reverse on the spring equinoxes, before completing the great year, the procession of the equinox. This new age of Aquarius is arriving within the next 200 years or so. Aquarius is open-minded, inventive, intellectual, reformative, and adventurous. It is also unpredictable, defiant, unemotional, and rebellious. It focuses more on the group than the singular. The current system in illusory Pisces is already in its dying days before this new age ushers in. Moving on, the astrolabe is a beautiful and intelligent device and can be traced back to around 200 BC. It has many uses, such as the sun's path and the time of day. It's made up of four plates and a ruler, and together each part has specific uses for measuring, observing and calculating. The device can be used for star locations, cardinal directions, wandering star positions, sunrise and sunset, eclipses, and so much more. And this still works today. No CGI and no Wi-Fi needed. Another device, the planisphere, can be traced back to the 1500s. This can display the visible stars in the sky for any time and date. And this still works as was designed. No 5G required. Both the astrolabe and the planisphere were totally designed within and for the Flat Earth Luminaries Mysterium. The zodiac is a wealth of energy, wisdom, archetype and meaning. Nobody knows who first grouped the 12 constellations on the ecliptic. But it is ancient, received from a higher state of consciousness, pre-flood for sure. Each sign has been anthropomorphized as figures, animals, and archetypes. Each sign has been studied and wondered over by mystics, astrologers, healers, and artists. The zodiac splits up the 12 months, four seasons, solstices, and equinoxes. Each star in the sky gives us energy, and why would you not believe that? The luminaries of the sun, moon, and wandering stars give us energy, and each star also gives us energy. Therefore, groups and clusters of stars also give us energy as collectives. Each sign has its own energy signature, its own archetypes. The sign motivates any wandering star within it and asks the wandering star, what is it seeking? Each zodiac sign is within one of four elements, one of three quadruplicities, and also a gender. As we already know, 
The wandering stars travel through the signs at different speeds and durations, and each sign has a ruling wandering star, and also a wandering star that when within it, is in its exaltation, detriment or fall. What zodiac sign a wandering star sits in is key to how the wandering star is filtered, how the ray of energy plays out, how it functions, how it's motivated, and each combination of wandering star and sign is vastly different. You should understand most of these symbols now. Think of each wandering star as a function of the psyche within all human beings. Think of each zodiac sign as the location of what the particular psyche function is seeking, how and where it will play out. So this is what astrology is, the wandering star and the zodiac signs in constant movement behind the ecliptic and their infinite amount of combinations allow for luminology stroke astrology to be achieved, recorded, projected and practiced. This is a repeatable science. Edgar Case once said, the signs of the zodiac are karmic patterns, the wandering stars are the looms, the will is the weaver. The aspects are some specific geometry between the wandering stars on the circular ecliptic. Each human has a unique personal astrology chart for the moment he or she was born, a natal chart or soul blueprint. This natal chart holds one's talents, challenges, emotional and communication dynamics, evolution and much more within it. The energies of the 12 signs are already within each human being but each human being has a different balance of them, with amplifications and gaps. The evolutional quest is to be a perfect balance of all twelve, all radiating in their best octave. Remember, all twelve signs and all the wandering stars each have a specific energy. When an energy is too amplified or overpowered, it spills into shadow traits. Each of the energies can also be latent, weak, or underpowered in one's chart. The natal chart really yields gnosis on the self. Each day, the different permutations of geometric aspects in the sky and the combinations of energies in the sky all create flux in this reality. It gets human dynamic and interaction in this reality moving and changing. If one overlays one's natal chart with today's sky chart, or tomorrow's, or next week's, or any date or time in the future, one can see what energies are at play, and navigate that moment, or that hour, or that day, whether it be a meeting, or a wedding, or a new project. And the elite really don't want you to know this stuff, but Wall Street, governments, and the military all use this science of the sky. Remember, astrology is not something to live underneath or fear, it is a tool. We all have free will and can each swerve, dark or ride any coming energies. The sky is the engine room of this reality. Astrology is a finger pointing at reality. Now Western mystics studied astrology deeply and knew how to understand and interpret the sky. How to bring the macrocosm down to the microcosm in a multitude of ways. Many self-initiatic mystery schools had an experience where in a vivid dream or altered state, all the stars would fall into the person at once and the initiate would wake up with a jolt, at a higher vibration, changed. You may think this is folly, but this is real. The zodiac signs are also related to the tarot, the major arcana. And each third of each sign is assigned to a minor arcana. 
both are shown here. The profane think tarot is just for divination, but the tarot energies are forever present through the sky, through time, fitting like a glove to the energies of luminology. It might be wise to ask yourself why astrology is not taught at colleges or universities. I have had over a hundred flat earth astrology clients and for a deeper look into the changes flat earth brings, plus more about signs, aspects, orbs and houses, please see my dedicated video on this same channel. There are flat earth zodiac clocks and zodiac symbolism all around old European churches. So it's a little bit strange that many modern day Christians look at astrology as something bad. So sit back and take in the next minute or so. We still need to cover some of the other luminaries in the sky, ones with wild stories within the zombie matrix. The idea of galaxies is deranged, just a luminary of cloudiness in the sky. This is what they call Andromeda. The idea of a black hole is idiotic, just a luminary that pulses in the sky. The idea of nebulas is demented, just shaped light in the sky. The elite tell you it is an interstellar cloud of dust, hydrogen, helium and other ionized gases. That the Orion Nebula is 1300 light years away and 12 light years in radius. I mean tell a tall story or what? I mean this elite are smart but also very psychotic. This is the heart and soul nebula. <laughs> A comet is simply a cyclic luminary in the sky with its own cyclic path, with no care for the ecliptic. Shooting stars are simply lights that wisp across the sky, appearing randomly, 
but often at synchronistic moments. These are not meteorites. There is no evidence of these so-called meteorites ever landing on Earth. If these were real, every month or so a house or a building would be destroyed. The very rare and very dodgy articles from the Smithsonian Institute, which have previous if you know my work, and other mainstream news agencies don't really give us any hard evidence. These scorched rocks do exist though, but obviously they do not come from the fairy tale that is outer space. This is supposed to be the biggest meteorite on Earth. No crater nearby, no witnesses. Now to diverse just a little bit, giant craters probably were created from sinkholes or from some ancient technology. We don't really know. But we do know that a lump of rock didn't land and then just vaporize on impact. And we know that a fireball making a big dent in the ground isn't really rational. More on the cover-up of meteorites and craters is in my EDGE documentary. Now meteor showers are just cyclic wispy luminaries that come in groups. The Perseids shower every August is the brightest. The dense and cloudy area of stars in the sky is known as the Milky Way. This is not really what this was called. This was called the Great Rift or the Dark Rift by different people all around the world. I did a whole documentary exploring some of the ancient myths and knowledge surrounding this area of the sky luminaries. Feel free to check it out. The northern lights are highly probable to come out of the north center. We don't know what they are, but they must be linked to magnetic electro and stroke or divinity. The light pillar phenomena occurs rarely and randomly where it is cold. The story of ice and optics doesn't work for me. Going full cult scientism on divine beauty is fool's work. The sky is a giant calendar. The sun tells the time, the moon tells us the day, and the stars tell us the months and years. We live inside a beautiful realm, a perfectly designed timepiece with mathematics and fractals within its fabric. The sky is the only real tangible calendar. What else is there to live by? The toxic Gregorian calendar, the Catholics fed you, dates your boss tells you, days of celebration your governments tell you, or is it wiser to live by the energies and events in the sky, the dance of the luminaries, the art of astrology, which is happening above your head and you don't give it a moment's thought because you've been conditioned not to care or wonder or contemplate. This realm is divine, it is created by higher consciousness, a higher power. The luminary's dance of geometry allows the one thing to weave energy into this dimension. Through rays of energy, a subtle and gentle communication to our minds and souls, forever changing the permutations, creating a foundation of flux for this realm we are in, a realm of divine fractals hidden from our consciousness, so beautiful yet so subtle. The elite hide the truth of the luminaries as they are trying to limit the whole human experience to the physical, the physical is only a base, it's not the real thing. They want you pushed into the Sephiroth of Malkut, as a materialistic conforming drone. But we are both visible and invisible. We need to honour the totality, not just what we can touch. Da Vinci said, there are three types of people, those who see, those who see when shown, and those that don't see and one starts to see only when one starts deprogramming. And it's not an easy ride, but it does get easier. This is the work of the modern day warriors, deprogramming. We don't know our cosmology, but we do know we are in a magical realm of divinity. 
Are you just coming from the mind to know the sky? Or are you reveling in the energies and the invisible wonders of the Luminaries Mysterium? The Luminaries Mysterium is a key out of the Matrix. Out of the cult-like scientism religion. But you have to embrace the sky's truth. Love the sky. A beautiful gift from our creator. Many of you are trying to rationalize a divine mysterium. And one's life here is full of questions. But only fools are full of answers. Srimad Bhagavatam 2637 And because all of us are bewildered by the illusory external energy of the Supreme Lord, we can see only this manifested cosmos according to our individual ability. Corpus Hermeticum the secret sermon on the mountain. For I will sing the praise of him who found it all, who fixed the earth and hung up heaven.